would you counsel someone if you're having this epiphany for the first time? Mm -hmm. What are some things like, you see these three things, we got it for sure. What you see in vulnerable narcissistic people is a chronic grudge. That's what it is. It's the chronic grudge. It's like, it's in a lot of it comes out in political conversations, but it could even be like, ah, that neighbor, ah, your brother. Ah. It's like, ah. it's this, it's this, it's grudge. It's a constant grudge and grievance. And there, there's a, a, um, and it's it, the grudge and grievance is as though even these sort of random things that happen to be happening in the world seem to be targeted at them. So that takes us to the second thing, which is this chronic sense of suspiciousness. People are kind of, out to get them that the bad things are negatively targeting them they're just literally a hair away from seeming paranoid right it it, it really feels as they they almost feel like people are out to get them but it's not quite that bad but it's this sense of he's always trying to make me mad I'm like no i think he just parked his car there i don't think he was thinking about it this is a good parking spot right but yes. they're thinking that the person parked the car there to piss them off. Yes. They make the person's parked car about them. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I feel like I'm having a trauma response <laughs> as I hear you describe this because grudge and this edge. And the suspiciousness. And that it's like happening to it's the traffic. Me. So many people have moved here and the traffic is right, really terrible. Right, and somehow right. it's personal about, it's to personal. me. Or you're too busy yep. at work. And so you never come to see me. That's right. So it's that. And then the third piece is that victimhood. One thing that you know Keith Campbell and I talked about, which is it's the sense of the grandiose narcissist, they'll have a big dream and it's big and they'll do the thing, right? And they may, 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 may might even succeed. In fact, I think all the big things in our life, in our lives, the big, big stuff, probably there's, there's a lot of grandiose narcissism behind that. The vulnerable narcissistic people talk about the big thing and they never take the step. And they never take the step because everyone's against them. Hmm. I got the idea for the biggest book ever. It's the biggest book ever. Like, wait till you hear about this. Like, ugh, like it's 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 going to be so great. Not one word to paper. And like, oh, you know what, Mel? You got you got so many easy breaks. It was all it was really easy for you. Like, my idea is way bigger than your idea, Mel. But you know, ugh, I'm not going to waste my time with these publishers. Never. They're not able to see how great I am. It's that. Does that make sense? They're going to put you down. They're going to lift themselves up. They never do the thing, but they talk as though they are doing it. That's a real harm, hallmark of vulnerable narcissism. And ultimately, it looks like failure to launch. Can you explain triangulation? That was mm-hmm. a term that my therapist used that really had me go ding, 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 ding. And I think it's tied into the grudge and that feeling of like the world is against me. But can you explain that behavior mm-hmm. of triangulation? So triangulation is a power move, right? So it is a, it's, it, there's a, another piece to remember about vulnerable narcissism is there's a lot of passive aggression there, mm-hmm. right? Passive aggression is a real signature characteristic of vulnerable narcissism and things like the silent treatment and all of that. What passive aggressive and grudgy people do is they talk through other people. They talk through a third party, right? So it can feel, at times it can feel gossipy, but instead of coming directly to you, talking directly to you, they will plant all these victimized seeds in other people who are fertile targets. Those people might even sympathize with the vulnerable narcissist, making the person who should have been on the other side of the direct communication, the villain. So by doing this, they actually, in some strange way, lift themselves up. Everyone's like, oh, I'm so sorry. That that person should have been more supportive. I, I'm so sorry this happened to you. Let me see if I can talk to them. Mm-hmm. And then that person who you may actually have a good relationship with is now coming to you and you're like, what? And now you're kind of having friction with the messenger, but the messenger is really just carrying the bag of grudge that the vulnerable narcissist gave them. And when this happens, you can imagine where this really happens is workplaces. One vulnerable narcissist can upend a really good work team. Can you give us some examples? So a great example of that would be, you've got the victimized vulnerable narcissist who doesn't want to work as hard as everyone else, who feels like things should come easier, who might even be jealous of other people in the workplace that are leveling up, right? So they complain to other people. 
Vulnerable narcissist is savvier than you think because they're paying attention to who the fertile targets are, who's willing to sit with them, who's willing to say, no, 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 you're really smart too. I could totally see this working out for you. But what they're doing though too is they're raising suspicion about oftentimes the mission and vision of the organization or the other people who are succeeding in the organization. And what it does is it, it it ruins the sense of collaboration so mm. it would be that person who's just like can you believe her like she's i don't know i'm not i'm not such a big fan of her and then they keep talking and talking talking enough people start to agree and then you'll see eye rolling at a meeting or you might see people just ugh, like a lot of that stuff and then people are noticing like gosh it feels more intense here than it always was but it was that one vulnerable narcissistic person who didn't want to do the work who was always complaining, who was very entitled, but in this grudging way, so people felt guilty about it, felt pity for them, and now all of a sudden the energy in the room has changed. In a family, forget oh. about it. I, I mean, mean it well, is... I, I sound like, I, I feel like you're describing a family and a mm -hmm. parent that then goes to a sibling yep. who's mad at the other sibling. sibling, and so that sibling becomes a messenger. Friend groups, yep. where the person who feels left out goes to a friend mm -hmm. to complain that yep. they feel sad so that the friend then goes to the person organizing yep. the party so and so feels mm -hmm. left out wow mm -hmm. and then what it does though is when we really see triangulation at the highest levels mm -hmm. the narcissistic person's almost like a puppeteer pulling the strings they get to be above it all and they get to watch all the chaos that's starting to ensue so what was once a healthy family healthy work group healthy group of friends is now more fractured centralizing more power in the narcissistic person so does the person that has a narcissistic personality style are they conscious that they're doing this or is it like this immature emotional kind of stunted growth inside them that means that when they feel triggered or they feel that sense of grudge or the entitlement or the insecurity rises up that the emotion floods and this is just what they do. Mm -hmm. So this is where some people make the argument that narcissism is a trauma response, right? They're very quickly trying to feel safe. As the shame bubbles up, the only way I can describe, can I use a gross reference? You I can do what, it, you are the world's leading reference, expert, right? okay, do this it. This is really gross and down market, but I'm gonna say it. If you've ever had terrible diarrhea, okay? Yes. I'm just gonna be, this is gross, because this is as gross as it gets, and you're like, oh my God, if I don't get to a bathroom, I'm going to shit my pants, Yes. right? <laughs> think of the shame associated with that. And when you think of the shame, like I'm about to shit my pants in an airplane, in an airport, in a work meeting. It, think of how you feel like- Well, and also the urgency. the urgency. Like I'm like, I got to, like right. this is a, this like right now, right. get out of my way. Right. Yes. Right. So you're not listening to the meeting. No. You're not listening to the conversation. You're like, I have to get to a bathroom or I'm about to embarrass the hell out of myself. This is awful. And it gets to the point where you don't even think. Right. It like overrides. Okay. So that diarrhea is how a narcissistic person feels every time that shame starts to come up. That's the best way I can describe. So they're just like, they're not listening to their like shame coming up, but they're not, I don't even know it's shame. At least we know it's, you know, Right. What it is, right? Yeah. But they don't know. So it's this feeling of that sort of psychological diarrhea that's, and they're like, nobody can see this. I, I, and so what do they do? Their equivalent of running to the bathroom is to become entitled and grandiose, or in most cases, rageful. When we look at a Kohut's work on this, who was a, who a theoretician wrote back in the 60s and 70s, he would say this shame and rage is one of the central cores of the narcissistic presentation. So what will happen is the psychological diarrhea, got to find a bathroom. The bathroom right. is, F you, Mel. What are you, you don't know what you're talking about. So now I'm powerful. Mel is small. Crisis averted. When somebody who has a narcissistic personality style walks into a room, mm -hmm. what might they be feeling? They're casing the joint. You know how a, a, a thief or a burglar walks into a place or drives by a place and they're looking for all the places they could get in. Where could they get in? Where could they get caught? Where might the money be? 
that's what they're doing with you every they're casing the joint every time they meet you like what's the way in who who's got the power in this room who do i need to sit next to who do i need to talk to where's the stuff mm. they case the joint what they walk into a cocktail party watching a narcissistic person walk into a party i i don't like i'm an introvert so i don't like parties so when i go i try to figure out who the narcissists are so i can watch them work how do you spot them other than the the kid with the versace <laughs> sweatsuit on and the stroller well, and the mom they're, tapping they're, on her phone they're the adult with the versace, versace <laughs> yeah. sweatsuit who are sitting in a stro whatever the adult equivalent <laughs> of a stroller is they are they don't look at people they look through them mm. they have a remarkable capacity to be able to look at you but also be eyeing the door to see if someone more interesting is coming in or if there's someone else more interesting at the bar it may not be that they're more attractive it's just that they may bring something cooler more hip cred more validation more supply they're always working the room you can always see the sort of sweet agreeable people who will they'll have the long meandering boring conversation because they're sort of They've committed to it. And then they might find the graceful exit or someone may, you know, puncture the conversation. But the narcissistic person will just go and go until they find the best, if you will, target. Listen, I live in L.A. So every so often, especially before the pandemic, I think since the pandemic, my dance card has been less full. But before I'd go to parties where there'd be some people of some notoriety who the narcissistic people, when they'd see that famey fame person walk in, you, it's a wonder they didn't trip trying to get over to them. Like they would just abruptly leave conversations and then they would just cleave themselves to the so-called famous, notorious, powerful Hollywood person. It was, I mean, it was, it was actually quite fun to watch. They're like heat-seeking missiles. As soon as they found the power center of a group, that's where they're going to put their focus. Hmm. You've got uh, new research in It's Not You, and one of the things that you write about are the four myths about mm -hmm. narcissism. Can mm -hmm. you unpack those for us? So, you know, one of the key myths is that narcissistic people are always men. And I think that that's a dangerous myth, right? And again, I'm using the gender binary here. We still are, that this research is evolving. So yep. keep in mind, research often has like a 10 to 15 year delay, if you will. But using the binary is that narcissistic people grandiose narcissists are more likely to be men the combative what is the ma malignant, so malignant narcissism? narcissism is actually the most severe form of narcissism i always call it the last stop on the narcissism train before it veers into psychopathy station it's the it's where we see the dark tetrad where narcissism machiavellianism or the willingness to exploit others psychopathy and sadism all come together and that's a lot of what we see in malignant narcissism they are more coercive they're more exploitative, they're more manipulative, they're more isolating. They don't tend to have the big, bright, shiny, um, grandiose personalities. So is this when you get into severe emotional and physical abuse? Correct. Okay. Yes. And it may not even be physical. It may just simply be severe, isolated, coercively controlling kinds of financial abuse, um, mm -hmm. emotional abuse, that kind of thing. It's more menacing. Um, and I think that those kinds of qualities, again, tend not to be selected for in women. So we're going to see that more in men. But when we talk about communal narcissism, that sort of savior narcissism, this is where we see everything from new age folks to cult leaders to people who think they're saving the world and it's well people like saving the world like what do you mean they're rescuing puppies how could that be bad they're rescuing puppies though to get validation and admiration they probably like the puppies well enough but if nobody's recognizing all their puppy saving or their environmental saving or whatever it is they're doing they get angry they have to be recognized as humanitarians. They not only put themselves out there as these great humanitarian saviors, they still treat the people they're closest to quite terribly. Great example of this would be the person like, your dad, psh, pillar of the community, you're so lucky to be his kid in the little league and the mayor and the small town, and behind closed doors is screaming at that family, humiliating them, shaming them. And yet the world says, Psh, your dad's a pillar of the community. Mm. That's a great example of communal narcissism. So first myth that men 
are the narcissists. Right. What's the next myth? The second myth is that this is just bragging. It's just arrogance. It's just posturing. It's what we were talking about earlier. I think that somebody meets someone arrogant they're like, oh, that's a narcissist. And I'll always say, slow down, sister. Like, let's spend a little bit more time. I'm digging in. I'm trying to find the entitlement. It's a little bit hard to find sometimes because it might take a minute to unfurl. That's why even therapists, it takes us a minute before we could really say definitively someone has a narcissistic personality or a narcissistic personality disorder. Just because the person's arrogant just because a person's wearing designer labels. It doesn't mean they're narcissistic. So I say we have to be careful when it's sort of these forward kind of facing characteristics. The grudge really hit me and so did this distinction that you mentioned earlier between the difference between somebody being annoying versus somebody's behavior being harmful. That's exactly right. And that's the and that's the piece where, you know, this is what concerns me about the sort of the TikTokification of narcissism. Because what you're seeing there, and I've, I've run into this over and over again, a lot of the folks out there who sometimes put out narcissism content were hurt by a narcissist. I'll give you a classical example. Somebody's boyfriend cheats on them. He's a narcissist. I'm like, he cheated on you, not okay, but I need more. Right. Okay, so I think that this idea that somebody cheats that makes them a narcissist, do narcissists cheat more than other people? Absolutely, absolutely. Is everyone who cheats a narcissist? No. So I think that when a person's hurt in one way, we they want to make that leap. Mm -hmm. We even have to be careful there. So yes, and it's annoying. It is immature. We really latch on to the superficiality part of it. Just because somebody puts selfies on Instagram, it doesn't make them a narcissist. You know, there could just they could just be a sweetie. They just might just say, "Look, an autumn leaves tree," and this is me in front of it. And in some ways, it's I I look at those and I'm like sweet but i mean i oh, i mean it's a little image image well, well i think what it's you're immature. saying is really good so now i feel terrible about slamming the baby in the Verace, <laughs> versace thing but oh, i'm willing to take that bet mel because there the are multiple check boxes That's exactly in that right. scenario in a certain age and behavior by parents That's right. because i don't blame the child no at all no and I also, in learning everything that I've learned in a weird way, the person that I'm closest to in my life that has a narcissistic personality style, I don't even blame her. Or we shouldn't say them. I don't even blame them. Right. Because I understand what you're saying, which is this can be the result of adverse childhood experiences yeah. that mm -hmm. stunts somebody's emotional growth. Right. And this is where it gets the most tricky for survivors. Uh -oh. Right? Because yes. I hear you. And that's yep. exactly what I know. And many of the people I've known who are narcissistic clients I've treated and all of that. To still keep pinning it down to. And their behavior is not acceptable. You, number one, you're not responsible for their history. Number two, if they are a sentient, functional human being, they can take responsibility for their mental health. They have put you in the position of using you as a tool of regulation, pacifier, and punching bag. That's not okay, right? They can take responsibility, but they will dine out for the rest of their life on the idea of, I had a tough childhood. And they will, in these days more than ever, will commandeer the rough childhood explanation as the explanation for their behavior. This is why I'm saying we have to be careful while narcissism may be in part a trauma response. I'm gonna push back on that a little, which is a person who is had an adverse childhood yep. and is having consistent trauma responses, for example, safety behaviors and all that, they tend to be consistent. The narcissistic person knows what they're doing. How do we know they know what they're doing? Because you've gone through this too. Think of the dinner party scenario. The dinner party, they're so charming. In fact, someone even ribs them, makes a funny little joke at their expense and they laugh, ha, 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 ha. You're thinking, maybe I judged this person wrong. Maybe they're not narcissistic. You get in the car at the end of the night and they go off for the next hour. They knew what they were doing. They waited till they got in the car. That's not a lack of insight. They knew exactly what they were doing. What is narcissism? Narcissism is a personality style. Let's move the disorder piece off to the side. Every time I talk to you, I start to wonder, am I a narcissist? 